All right, so this is your comprehensive review for weeks four and five. It's going to include a lot of body systems. I know everyone was super concerned um, about the cranial nerves, so I have eliminated all that I can with the cranial nerves so that we can focus on that for um, our lab portion uh, of this class, and we can use that opportunity to then reiterate cranial nerves and their importance. Uh, but for the purposes of this exam, I, I have to, you know, ask two questions about cranial nerves, but we will clearly go over those. I'm not going to include cranial nerves on this lecture slide. I will do the 12 cranial nerves, all of the pieces and positions that it innervates. I will do that on a separate um, guided lecture probably in the next week or two. Um, so that way we have a better understanding of what that looks like and you can better apply it to um, your lab and that instruction so that you can be familiarized. Um, so yeah, pay attention to everything just like before. Make sure you're taking really good notes. Make sure if I say write this down, you write it down. Um, things are super transparent with me. I don't like a lot of smoke and mirrors. So if I say that, believe that. Um, and let's go ahead and get started. So uh, going back to our mental health assessment lecture, um, we always need to evaluate the person's risk of harm to self or to others. So we need to ask about suicidal ideation and homicidal ideation. Um, a patient who has a specific plan for suicide is at a much greater risk than someone who has no plan whatsoever. So we always ask specifically, have you thought about harming yourself or your others? And then beyond that, we ask, do you have a plan? And it's very nonchalant, it's very like that, uh, because we want to be um, in a position where we're not roundabout, because if we are tiptoeing over this idea and they are already um, during the planning and implementation phase of um, suicidal ideation, at that point, if we tiptoe too much, we might actually give them opportunity to be successful in that attempt um, because we didn't ask the tough questions when we were supposed to. So when we deal with someone who has potential for suicidal ideation, we need to um, make sure that we're asking the appropriate questions, which is very simply, have you thought about harming yourself? And then from there, we would extend, if there was a yes to that answer, we would extend what, what specifically is your plan? And then at that point, we would take steps to protect the person um, who was planning to hurt themselves so that we can, if, if they say that they were going to, you know, um, cut their wrists maybe. Um, I'm going to make sure that anything that is jagged and that a person can cut themselves on is not going to be available for them. Um, for people who say that they're going to swallow things, we get rid of trash bags, uh, we get rid of tampons, things of that nature, because those items can be swallowed um, and have uh, been or have had a history of being successful in their attempt in the hospital setting using those items. Um, so that's why they're not allowed to have things like phone cords and trash bags and um, you know, feminine hygiene products like tampons um, because in the past they have been used to um, be successful in their attempt and we don't want that to happen obviously. Uh, so that's pretty much all you need for this slide. We'll go to the next one now. All right, so skin lesions and cancer inspection. This is a pretty important one. Um, we need to know lots of things about this suspicious lesion um, when we are looking for uh, a, an abnormal um, area of the skin, whatever that looks like. So I need to know where it's at. I need to know how it's distributed. Um, I need to know if it's raised. I need to know if there's a pattern. Most importantly of all of these things, I need to know the color of the lesion, okay? The color. Because if it's multicolored um, or if it is a light brown color versus a black with a brown speck in it or black with a red speck in it or anything of that nature, we could be talking about like a mole or a freckle that's benign versus something that's very serious. So I need for you to describe the color of the lesion, super important. Also the shape of the lesion is very important because if it's under a centimeter, it's considered to be a benign process until it gets over that threshold, okay? So um, how big is it? 
that's the second most important thing. The depth of it, right? Is it flat, raised, or sunken? That's going to make all the difference in the world because that is also going to be associated with how deep it is into the skin. So the way we need to look at skin cancer is it doesn't start at the top, okay? It kind of starts in the middle and then grows outward. So by the time we see the lesion for traditional melanoma at that point, it's already stage three or stage four because it actually starts within the tissues itself where you can't see it. And then it grows up like a, like a flower, right? So the bulb itself would be the initial representation of the cancer. And as it grows and it breaks the surface and you can see the leaves and you can see you know, the bud growing and all of those things, that's when we recognize it and that's when we're able to scrape it and then test it and then confirm that this is you know, in fact melanoma. So depth is very important. Size is very important. So size, shape, depth, and color four most important things specific to lesions and suspicion of cancer. Okay, next slide. All right, so let's talk about jaundice. When we talk about jaundice, there's a lot of things that can create jaundice. So the biggest one that everyone thinks of is the liver, which is accurate, but we don't think about things like cholecystitis, right? And if, if those uh, biliary junctions um, are occluded. If those get a stone caught in it or if they get occluded or bogged down, all of that muddiness that, uh, that your gallbladder creates and, and filters through then backs up, right? So then one of the side effects is you will get jaundice. Another one's pancreatitis. Pancreatitis will absolutely cause the jaundice of the skin. Um, and we don't talk about it eh, so, so much. So jaundice isn't just liver. I want you to, to understand that. Um, there are bile ducts uh, or biliary ducts that might also become occluded uh, or become kinked or become uh, malfunctioned or there's a malformation, whatever the case may be. Um, and these will always create the idea of, of jaundice in an individual for varying degrees. Um, so jaundice in the sclera in the eyes and the palms of the hands um, can be found and seen in light and dark skin patients. As a matter of fact, the sclera is usually the first point of contingency that they ask you to look for that yellowing of the, the color um, that would let us know, um, hey, listen, our bilirubin's getting backed up, something's wrong, right? Which is why our jaundice is, is definitely nice and yellow. Uh, instead of axillary and groin, assess the sclera of the eyes. We just talked about that. Uh, pale skin may indicate anemia, but not jaundice. That is very important. Pale skin will potentially um, indicate anemia, but jaundice is the yellowing of the skin, right? Um, yellow color of the palms is going to indicate jaundice, and dark skin people, um, ashen gray color may be seen. Uh, for dark skin patients who are cyanotic, um, but jaundice uh, is yellowish color in the sclera, the eyes and palms, the hands, and that is light and dark skin patients. And in some cases, it may be uh, for darker skin people, that yellowing may be um, a greenish tinge as well, like a yellowish green tinge versus the ashen gray that we would see in a darker person with cyanosis. Uh, so please understand that if you're darker, it's not necessarily just yellow. It might be a yellowish, greenish, darker derivative of that color. Um, so please make sure if we have darker patients that we are taking that into consideration. Next slide. Okay, so just reiterating what we talked about in the last slide. Um, when we talk about dark skin people um, in general, their variation of color is going to be a little bit different when we're referring to things like erythema, when we're talking about um, cyanosis, when we talk about jaundice, things of that nature, okay? So first and foremost, mucous membranes do not change color from jaundice. Mucous membranes will not change color in jaundice, period, okay? Erythema will, for a darker patient, present as brown or purple in tone. So this is erythema. This is not jaundice. Cyanosis is going to be ashen gray, all right? And that will also be in the oral mucosa as well. But for jaundice in darker skin patients, it is a yellowish green color that can be seen most obviously, again, this is always the most obvious choice, is the sclera, palms of hands, soles of feet. All right, next slide. 
All right, so let's talk about a little bit further in depth with um, integumentary assessment. So when we're dealing with skin, the most common miscommunication of skin, believe it or not, is in petechiae. So petechiae are pinpoint lesions. So over here to the left, I'm gonna use my little pointer, over here to the left, this is um, a slice of someone's skin with petechiae lesions in it, okay? So it's literally pinpoint, 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 pinpoint. If you were to get a pin, put, you bunch, put a bunch of dots on your hand, and if they were super duper purple and a little bit of red, that would be petechiae. So we get this for a lot of different reasons. Some people get it with aging process. Some people get it uh, when they are anemic. Some people get petechiae for medication. Some people get petechiae because they have uh, a bleeding disorder um, or if they have a high platelet level. Like th these are all reasons for petechiae, okay? So they're not uh, patches, they're not nodules, they're not generalized areas, they are petechiae, purplish red pinpoint lesions. Please understand that. All right, next slide. Okay, so when we are assessing the nails, we need to take close inspection because there are many things that can be wrong with nails that can indicate things like a fungal infection, uh, cancer, um, injury or trauma, illness, things of that nature. So nails, um, the surface should be smooth and rounded. That's an expected finding. So nail surface that's smooth and rounded is going to be our normal clinical finding in our normal patient. That would be the expected finding. Um, the expected angle of the nail base is 160 degrees. Expected, we're supposed to have it. Now, patients with dark pigmented skin they have nails that are normally uh, like a yellowish or a brownish color, um, and they may have vertical banded lines. That's going from down to up versus transverse, which is going from left to right. Transverse depression running across the nails is different than a vertical banded line. So please understand if you see transverse depressions running across the nails, so from left to right, that is a bow line. A bow line is not a normal finding. A bowline indicates that nails have stopped growing due to injury or illness of some form. Okay, so that's definitely something that we would need to annotate and um, contact the physician about because we might need to do some lab work. We might need to, um, you know, check to do an x-ray, see if we've broken something along the way. Um, because that's usually due to a crush injury. Um, or some significant uh, illness um, or something that's, you know, like an autoimmune process even. Um, so that needs looked further into, whereas um, the other points of contingency are all normal findings. It's just some are specific to some people, some are specific to people who are a little bit darker in skin color, no big deal. All right, next slide. Okay, so um, hair, skin, and nail inspection and palpation. So... Um, what I want to do is give you guys an idea of what documentation looks like and how we should understand our documentation. So up here I have an excerpt, scalp is bald, freckles are noted on the face, back arms and legs, and skin turgor is elastic. Those are expected findings for a healthy adult male. So I'm cool with all of those things, all right? Things like transverse depression, like we talked about in the last slide, across the nails, that's a bowline. It is not an expected finding. It results from stresses, um, trauma, um, uh, autoimmune disorders, um, illness, things of that nature that impairs your ability to form nails appropriately. Um, an elevated firm, a circumscribed area, less than a centimeter on the fingers is a papule, like a wart. You need to know these things, for sure, for sure. Purpura and ecchymosis, or ecchymosis, on the arms and legs, that's an indicator of bleeding. That's an indicator of someone having an increased bleeding risk. Hemophiliacs, I've got petechiae, purpura everywhere. If you want to see what it looks like, 
just pull me to the side during class or just ask me in the middle of class because I've got nothing to fear in this world, right? So I'll show you um, because as someone who has, you know, derivative hemophilia, um, <clears throat> it happens often and it's nothing that I can do. It just is what it is, right? So make sure that you understand expected findings, make sure that you understand abnormal findings and make sure what causes it, that you understand that and make sure that you understand um, what is something that uh, would be a way of documenting that. So we would say physically to document transverse depression across the nails indicating bowlines, indicating, not saying they are, indicating, big difference. Because we never want to become the physician. We just want to, uh, we just want to document what we see. So we could say reminiscent of bowlines, we could say indicating potential for bowlines, um, things of that nature. We're not going to call it specifically that um, as conviction, that wouldn't be a smart idea. So we can get as close as we can without going all the way there and deciding that, you know, we have become the physician and diagnosed. But if we see these things, this is how we would describe them. Cool. All right. Next slide. All right. So when we're talking about migraines, <clears throat> there's always a miscommunication between migraines, cluster headaches, and vertigo. So I just want to go ahead and clear this up. So migraines. Signs and symptoms of a migraine include nausea, vomiting, visual disturbances. Okay, All of these are symptoms associated with migraines. Ringing of the ears or dizziness is a sign of vertigo. Has nothing to do with a migraine headache at all. Ringing of the ears is called tinnitus, T-I-N-N-I-T-I-S, I believe is correct. Or is it T-I-N-I-T-A-S? I think it's T-I-N-N-I-T-I-S. Hang on. T-I-N-N-I-T-I-S. T-I-N-N-I-T-U-S. Hi. All right, see, T-I-N-N-I-T-U-S, tinnitus, oh, duh, us. Um, that is going to be ring of the ears or dizziness. Sometimes could be a derivative of vertigo. Um, red watery drooping eyelids, that's cluster headaches, not a cluster migraine. There is no cluster migraine, there are cluster headaches, and then there are migraines, but you don't combine the two. Nasal stuffiness or discharge, also a symptom associated with cluster headaches, okay? Remember, cluster headaches, big bad pain, big bad pain fast, big bad pain associated with a lot of things. Um, or an allergen versus migraines, uh, which is a whole different uh, way that it, it goes about the connections um, to create this disturbance without getting too much into pathophysiology and freaking you guys out. Just know, migraines, nausea, vomiting, visual disturbances, what helps it? Cool, dark, and quiet. There you go. Cool, dark, and quiet. That's what helps those things in time and medications. Okay, next slide. All right, so when we are doing um, head, neck, nose, mouth inspection, um, we are trying to figure out if anything is infected, traumatic, or an allergy, basically. Okay, so you can tell by the drainage, right? So purulent, green, yellow drainage, sinus infection nasal infection, all right? Foul smelling drainage, usually a foreign object in the nose. Usually it's a toy car or a Tic Tac or an M&M or a pen. Don't ask how I've seen that, but I have. Um, or some rando thing, right? Bloody drainage is going to be trauma to the nose. Watery drainage is gonna be a nasal allergy. Please understand the difference in the formation and the difference in presentation of these four. Next slide. All right, everybody calm down, don't freak out. I know it says cranial nerve inspection. I know we're talking about cranial nerves, but here's the thing. When I had an option to pick the questions for this examination, the ones that I had to look at were so confusing in its wording that I was more afraid that you were going to not interpret the question appropriately and answer it incorrectly then I was more afraid of you learning three cranial nerves. So I'm gonna give you three, right? This represents one quarter of the cranial nerves. And it's not gonna be that difficult because these are the easiest cranial nerves ever 
and I'm going to explain why. First one, to check facial symmetry, we're going to check cranial nerve 7, which is the facial cranial nerve. Okay? It's number 7. A lot of people like the number 7 because it's a, a religious number for a lot of different religions. So I always say um, the face is the the face is the most uh, viewed thing it's the thing that makes us chipper and cheery and wonderful and uh, we are created in our creator's image and our creator likes the number seven many creators like the number seven and many creators believe and state that we are created in their image so I guess maybe that's how I could associate it with cranial nerve seven, the facial cranial nerve. Um, movement of extraocular muscles, which are controlled by ocular motor, trochlear, and abducens cranial nerves, which is three, four, and six, okay? Now, I clustered all of these together on purpose because usually three, four, and six since they are all extraocular muscles, they like hang out together, okay? So if you are dealing with trochlear, or trochlear, however you wanna pronounce it, abducens, and ocular motor, okay? This is movement of the extraocular muscles. So literally, extraocular muscles, ocular motor, it's there, trochlear and abducens, Without getting too super confusing, those are obviously extraocular muscles. Look at them, um, give it a Google, and just know three, four, and six go together. Three and four, one, two, three, four, and two times three is six. Cool, how about that? Two eyes, two extraocular muscles, times three for cranial nerve three, and you get six. And the number after three is four. So they are easy, okay? Number three, not cranial nerve three, number three point, movement of the tongue is controlled by the hypoglossal cranial nerve, cranial nerve 12. All right, stop. Hypo means below. Glossal comes from the Latin word glossa, which literally means tongue. So the lower part of your tongue, right? So movement of the tongue, pushing the tongue forward, all of these are movements to see if you have controlled effect on cranial nerve 12 and if things are functioning appropriately. So memorize those three pieces and points and we're gonna be fine. All right, we'll worry about all the 12 cranial nerves, all the bits and bobs and pieces and parts. We'll learn about that for lab. For right now, for the purposes of this exam, Know those guys, know what that means, and move on. Next slide. Okay, with cranial nerves three specifically, uh, four and six, we are going to check cardinal fields of gaze to check functionality of those cranial nerves, okay? So the nurse is gonna ask the patient to keep the head stationary, and then we're going to have them move and follow the finger as it moves side to side, up, down, and obliques, right? This is going to be the test to check um, for three, four, and six. Now, just to check for three, there is going to be an additional test that you also need to know about. And it's a very easy test, and we're going to talk about it next slide. But for the purposes of this slide, when we're testing three, four, and six, we're doing the cardinal fields of gaze. So let's go to the next slide and see what else we got. All right, so cranial nerve three is ocular motor. So in order to check ocular motor, we're gonna check oculo, which is eye, and then motor, which is the ability for movement. Um, we're going to check the eye's ability to move appropriately. So the first thing we're gonna check, and the most important thing we're gonna check, is pupillary constriction of light. All right, that's the first thing. So once I put the light test on my eyes and I check for pupillary constriction, it looks good. Then I simply have them open and close their eyes to test, to test the actual functional ability of the eyes to open and shut. That's the only other caveat with cranial nerve three. 
okay, because we deal with pupillary constriction, eyelid movement, and eyeball movement. So specific to that, our modified checks that we're going to do for this one is going to include the points of gaze that we talked about, the fields of gaze, and we're also going to do pupillary constriction, have them close and open their eyes, all right? And that's it for number three. Next slide. All right, so when we are doing ears um, and we're inspecting, we need to test for hearing loss using the whisper test. So what we're going to do for that is stand one to two feet in front or to the side of the patient. You never stand behind them, right, because that's not where your ears are focused. They're not built to the back of your head. They're built to the sides and slightly in front, slightly anterior, right? That's kind of the reason that they have the curvature, right? So they can pick up all the sounds. So we would not stand behind them. That would make it nearly impossible if they do have hearing loss to at least try to be passable. A lot of people can't really hear what's going on behind them anyways, right? Because that's not where the ears are situated or how it works. So always um, to the front of them, to the side of them, never behind them. We whisper a very simple um, sentence, or we say a number, um, like, I don't know, 99, whatever it is. Um, and then they just repeat that back to us. So that's the idea of the whisper test. But it's very important that you understand that your position is just as important as uh, their ability to do a good job with this examination. So it's, it's all about how we approach them behind them it's not going to do any good so that's that next slide so let's go over some uh, nasal mucous membrane inspection um, abnormalities as well as what the expected normal findings are so deep pink turbinates those are normal and expected for any nasal inspection. What those are is they're tiny structures inside of your nose. They cleanse, they heat, they humidify air as it passes through your cavity um, and into your lungs. They can become inflamed and swollen if there's like an irritant, like an allergy or an infection, um, but it's only a temporary process. But those deep pink turbinates are exactly what it's supposed to look like. Give it a Google, it's totally worth it. Um, it's just the internal structure of your nose. Um, whereas the red edematous mucous membranes, that indicates a local infection within the nose itself. Um, a septum that angles to the left or to the right, that's abnormal. Um, clear exudate is going to be uh, indicative of a nasal allergy. So normal findings are going to be uh, those deep peak turbinates, all right, no big deal for that. And the other things is going to be based on some type of infection or some type of abnormal finding or deviation. So I need for you to know what is normal, what isn't normal, what could it be if it's not normal. So if um, it says that nasal septum angles to the right. We need to know, is that appropriate or not? No, it's going to cause a uh, nasal septal defect potentially and um, could cause them to snore, could cause them to uh, be apneic depending on what that looks like um, and cause a host of other issues. So next slide. All right, so pressure injury and inspection and grading. You're going to need to know every single one of these, period, point, paragraph. You're going to need to know what stage it is, what the skin looks like. It's going to use trigger words like blanchable versus non-blanchable. If it's non-blanchable, it's a stage one, right? Um, it's usually over bony prominence. Intact skin is usually a thing. Stage two um, is thickness and loss of the dermis. Um, stage three is full thickness. Uh, damage or necrosis of the subcutaneous tissue. Four is going to um, be slothy, eschar, uh, present within the wound bed. Um, undermining might be a part of it as well. Um, exposed bone, tendon, or muscle is the big deal. So it depends on what layer you are at, which will depend upon the stage of the ulceration. And unstageable means the whole thing is covered with sloth or eschgar, and you can't really tell until you debride the whole thing how, how truly deep it is. Um, so 
with this slide specifically, you have to know stage one, stage two, stage three, stage four. You need to know what the presentation of the skin looks like. Um, and you need to know what's present. So like if I tell you the patient has a partial thickness loss of the dermis with a shiny um, ulcer, you're going to need to know this is stage two. Um, there's no way of getting around it, so just go ahead and make your chart, memorize it how you want to, and then we'll go to the next slide. So I wanted to clear up some things. When we're doing a respiratory inspection and we're doing evaluation of chronic hypoxia, uh, this would be within our lung lecture. Um, I saw a caveat that I wanted to throw out there that you guys definitely need to know about. So when we're doing chronic hypoxia, let me get my little pointer. So when we're talking about chronic hypoxia, it's got to be a chronic condition, right? Otherwise, it would be acute hypoxia, right? So the deal with this is, is a pulmonary infection is acute. Trauma, if you have trauma to the thorax, it's affecting your ability to breathe appropriately because you have a crush injury, it's acute. Allergic reactions that you have, it's acute, right? The only thing that's not acute are things like COPD or emphysema. Those are going to cause clubbing of your fingers. And the clubbing of your fingers is due to chronic hypoxia. So that is something that we would see chronic hypoxia in, is a patient with COPD or emphysema that we would have these developed clubbing of the fingers. So please understand the difference in the two and please be able to recognize it. Next slide. So I need for you guys to be uh, present and understanding of the sounds uh, that your lungs create. So a common sound is ronchi, which is a low pitched coarse soaring snoring sound in a patient's lungs. Uh, usually during inhalation. Wheezes can be inspiratory or expiratory, and it's a high-pitched musical sound similar to a squeak. I always think of Toy Story 3 um, and the little squeaker guy that loses his squeaking mechanism, so they put him at the top of the shelf. Oh, that's Toy Story 2, huh? I think it's Toy Story 2. Yeah, for sure. Um, and then crackles um, are fine, high-pitched crackling and popping noises. Here, I can show you crackles. You ready? Because oh, I have a drink. You ready? That's what crackles sound like. It's like blowing into to chocolate milk. That's the sound of a crackle. All right, next slide. So now let's talk about the different types of respirations. Normal respirations are 12 to 20 a minute. Um, there is uh, bradypnea, which is slower than 12 per minute. There's tachypnea, which is faster than 20 per minute. There's hyperventilation, which is faster than 20 per minute with deep breathing involved. There's Kuzmal respirations, which is rapid, deep, and labored. Um, I want you to look up, give it a Google, Kuzmal versus Cheyenne-Stokes, because Cheyenne-Stokes is a pattern of breathing consisting of varying periods of increased depth, and then uh, with a sprinkle of apnea put into the middle. So I need for you to understand the technical definitions of all of these terms, right? And then I need for you to understand the terms and memorize them, right? Because there's going to be an incident, probably, where I, or an instance where I'm going to say, hey, patient is breathing 20 beats per minute, uh, or 25 beats per minute with deep breathing in between, so this hyperventilation. Cool? All right, next slide. Now for respiratory auscultation, I, I feel like I need to just um, stop and let everyone know about this because respiratory auscultation is going to sound differently if I am listening to the top of my shirt versus up under my shirt. If I'm skin to bell um, or skin to diaphragm, I'm going to hear far better than if I have a shirt. So if you've ever listened in the shirt, you're going to hear two sounds. You're going to hear the sound of my shirt. And then you're going to sound my, hear my lungs. And in between all of that, you might hear crackling and popping, which might be just me um, accidentally grazing or pressing or added pressure to that shirt. So you need to auscultate your breath sounds uh, by placing the diaphragm against the person's skin. It's kind of like taking the blood pressure when someone's got a jacket on. Why would you do that? Because you're not going to get the right blood pressure. So why would you listen to them above the skin when you know you don't need to listen to them? below the skin or at the skin, all right? So that would be my recommendation for this slide is just understand that concept and then move on. So when we talk about deep tender reflexes, most importantly, an expected response is a two plus, 
All right. D tendon reflexes are graded from zero to four plus. Four plus is hyperactive. Diminished is a one plus. A zero means there's nothing going on absent. Okay. So just know your levels, know what it means, know what a deep tendon reflex is and what it's used for, and what dysregulation means, right? What has happened to the brain and the body and what's the disconnect? What's caused the disconnect? Um, and definitely know your expected response, no hyperactive, no diminished, and no absent. Um, because there might be an assessment on a patient uh, who has a hyperactive response and you need to be able to recognize that that's a four plus. All right, next slide. All right, so when we're talking about testing balance, we're gonna be checking vestibular cochlear nerve, cranial nerve eight. I don't want you guys to freak out about cranial nerves, so don't. We're gonna test balance using Romberg. So Romberg is an idea where we have our patient or client, whatever you wanna call them, stand with their feet together, arms resting at the sides, eyes open, and then what we want you to do is we want you to have them shut their eyes. And what's gonna happen is, is if this patient has vestibular cochlear dysfunction, they are going to either sway or they're going to do a box step or they're just going to uh, fall to the side at a 45 degree angle, and there's pretty much no in between. Um, so positive findings would include, again, swaying, box stepping, losing balance at any point. All of those things are included, and that would make it a positive Romberg test. Um, and it, it's gonna test your cerebellar function specifically, um, and of course your vestibular cochlear abilities or your ability to have uh, a non-abnormal gait and appropriate balance. So next slide. All right, so this is the Glasgow Coma Scale, and it's very, very confusing. Um, it's intimidating in a lot of ways. The numbers are in reverse order, so the higher score you have means the higher functionability you have versus the lower score you have means you could be comatose or even brain dead, okay? So what we're going to have you do potentially is look at a scenario using the Glasgow Coma Scale to determine what their score is. Now there's a couple of ways we can do this. Very simply put, we can use this by guesstimating, right, and knowing what our, our brackets are. So 3 to 8, 9 to 12, 13 to 15, okay? So what you can do is you can read the excerpt about the patient's presentation and for things like uh, the client uh, only opens their eyes to their name being spoken, that would be to sound. So that would give us a score of three, right? Versus tapping, which would be pressure, versus nothing, meaning I could shake, spin, do all kinds of things, versus spontaneous, which means I just kind of wake up just for my general presence, all right? And then you go to the next section, so verbal response. So if I say the client can state their name, but doesn't know what year it is and doesn't know where they are, they're not oriented, they give me words and sounds, they give me something, so I would go with confused, which is gonna give me a score of four, okay? So, so far we're seven, all right? And then if I have someone who uh, moves their arm to painful stimuli but cannot move their arm on command, that's more of a localized sensation. So that's gonna give me like a five, right? So we know at that point we're in the moderate standing because uh, that's how you do math. Um, I hope that makes sense. So this is kind of what you would potentially do in a scenario where they give you information based off of the client's presentation and you look, you see is that spontaneous to sound to pressure or do they give me nothing, right? And then you would just calculate it and that's all I gotta say about this slide. Again, it's something that we use to determine if someone is brain dead, if someone is moderately functioning uh, or mildly um, having a deficit. And it's one of the criteria we use when we are talking about organ procurement along with a lot of other things. Um, and we use it on med surge units even uh, to determine how someone's doing, if they're having a change of condition, et cetera, et cetera. It's part of your uh, basic protocol um, that you would um, include into your assessment. So next slide. Now when we're doing mental status, we're doing alert and oriented to person, place, time, and situation, okay? So there's a couple of ways we can do this. The first thing we do is we come into the room, we greet them, we notice the response of the patient. If the patient isn't even acknowledging my presence, 
then they're probably not alert and oriented or they're in angry mood. So we have to dig in a little bit further. Um, so we would expect them to turn towards us and provide some type of response. Um, we would ask them what their preferred name is. Uh, preferred pronouns are always a good idea. Um, take the patient's history. Again, as we're doing this, we're watching their reaction to all of these things. We're watching their verbal reaction, their physical reaction, right? Um, and then we ask them uh, the pertinent questions that let us know if someone's oriented to person, place, time, and situation. So know these questions. Can you state your name? Can you tell me what year it is? Can you tell me where you are right now? Can you tell me today's date? Although, I'm going to be honest, most people in the hospital don't know today's date. I don't even know what today's date is, and I'm not in the hospital. I would assume it's like the 15th. It's the 14th. See, I just messed up. So that's why that's a terrible question, but that's just my personal opinion. What do I know, right? So we could probably find a better answer or a better question for that, but for the purposes of your examination, your exit HESI, your NCLEX, just go with what we know that's in the book. So we'll just leave it at that and move on. Uh, next slide. All right, so mental status, level of consciousness and inspection. So a change of consciousness is a huge deal because it could be a sign of impaired cerebral function, stroke, uh, cerebral hemorrhage with midline shift, things of that nature. Um, so what we do is we have to check our epic charting, or we have to check our standardized charting or our paper charting, whatever that looks like. Um, so what we would do is we would look at the 8 o'clock assessment and we would note that in this case a patient is probably fine at 8 o'clock, right? Alert oriented to person, place, time, and situation, not obtunded, yada, yada, yada. And then we go at 12 o'clock to go check on our patient or even 4 o'clock um, if we're in a med surge unit, we do an assessment every 4. Uh, we go back and look at our patient, and all of a sudden our patient isn't responding. I've got uh, one pinpoint pupil, one completely dilated pupil, which is indicative of a midline shift. Things are going haywire, um, and we know that that is not a normal response because at 8 o'clock they were in normal condition or in regular condition or presenting completely different. So we need to be able to recognize uh, when we're reading this material, at what point did this person turn? What was the last known well, is what they call it. When was the last known well? When were they last found to be alert and oriented to person, place, time, or situation, or at their baseline? All right. So there might be a scenario where I have you look at charting and tell me what that looks like. Tell me when the deficiency started. Tell me what happened to them. Um, tell me what we're concerned with, things of that nature. Next slide. All right, so I told you guys I was going to teach you prefixes, suffixes, and a lot of Latin. So that's what I kind of aim to do. Um, one of the things that I want to teach you is the prefix. So if you see words like antepartum, anta, pre, and pro can all mean before, depending on what the word indicates. All right, so um, pro is also known as beforehand in Latin, okay? Um, or in advance, such as when we provide somebody with something. I'm providing you with a lecture prior to your examination, so before your examination. Pre, we can use pre as in, I don't know, pre-tibial, right? That's pertaining to the area of the leg in front of the tibia. Fair enough, right? Anta means before or forward, all right, so like antiversion, that's an abnormal position of an organ where it's tilted, it's, uh, it's tilted, it's hiked at an angle, um, it is striated or structured independently from its normal axis uh, away from the midline, right? So it's, it's kind of conch, uh, catawampus, is that the word you guys use? I think it's catawampus. Yeah, when I moved to Ohio, you guys said catawampus a lot. So it's catawampus, it's not in the right place. So remember, anta, pre, pro, all prefixes definitely means before if used in the right, um, in the right way. Next slide, we're gonna learn about suffixes next. All right, so when we're talking about suffixes, let's use a big word. So let's use cholecystectomy, huge word. However, the suffix of that um, is uh, basically ectomy, which means the surgical removal, right? So cholecystectomy is a surgical procedure that removes the gallbladder, much like a prostatectomy removes the prostate, all right? 
So tinnitus. Tinnitus is a ringing in the ears. And again, ten means tinea, right? Um, and then ITUS is not ITIS, right? Because ITIS is in, an inflammatory mediator. Um, ITUS for Latin terms means to uh, be absent of, to depart, to go away. So ringing in my ears means I cannot hear. Um, my hearing has departed or gone away due to the ringing, right? Hemoptysis, hemo means blood right and p-t-y-s-i-s -S, or pop hemoptysis i i can't break the two apart for some reason hemop okay so tesis um, is going to be the term for expectoration so blood in the sputum would be hemoptysis so please understand that the latter portion of the full word you're dealing with is going to be considered a suffix, and you need to know what that means. And you need to know what uh, the definition of that suffix is. So like ectomy, removal, done. All right, next slide. All right, so let's talk about rounding all but briefly. So uh, let's say that our scenario is to round 10.04 to the nearest whole number, all right? So in this case, our answer is gonna be 10 because we're rounding to the nearest whole number and the whole number is gonna be 10. Zero right here is gonna represent the tens place, four is gonna represent the hundreds place. So if we round to the nearest whole number, we need to look to the right of the decimal and zero to um, four is going to be a do not round up situation, so you just leave it where it stands, and ten it is. In the case where this uh, position of the tenths place, if we had number six, um, anything from five to nine is going to round up by one. So in that case, if we had 10.64, it would be rounding to 11. I hope that makes sense. All right, next slide. All right, so here we have a client cannot afford the entire prescription of 60 pills and ask the pharmacist that they can receive just 10%. How many pills will they receive? So this is your formula in order to answer this type of question. This is my formula created by my dad, right? At least that's how I know it. Uh, it might be some math something or another, but um, this is the way dad always taught me. So percent over 100 equals is over of. And it literally says of 60 pills, so we put 60 here. The percentage is 10, so that's easy. And then you just cross multiply. So we have 100x, because you multiply those, and then you multiply these and you get 600, okay? And it's right here, and it's right here. And then, because we're solving for x, we need to divide by 100 here, divide by 100 here, and you're gonna get six. So that is how you do that. That's how you figure out how many they receive. All right, next slide. So with ratio and proportion, we are looking at the proportion of 20 milliliter suspension and 80 milliliter suspension. So 20, 40, 60, 80, that's four times. So 20 milliliters times four is gonna be 80 milliliters, that's right. So in order to do that, we also have to multiply this times four because it took us four to get from 20 to 80, so it's gonna take us four from this as well and multiply that by four and you get 400 milligrams because that's the answer, okay? Next slide. Now let's revert back to integumentary very quickly. Um, please know that a brown flat circular nevus or nevi is a classic description of a benign mole, classic. Now if the color changes or it varies or it's bigger than a centimeter like we talked about earlier or the mole is raised or it's itchy, okay, that would be considered suspicious and we need to do something about that. Also note, um, the the definitions down here a nevi is a mole uh, a viracle is a, a wart please understand those two pieces and parts and we can move on to the next slide all right so let's talk about visual acuity when you are testing visual acuity you're going to use a snellen chart for most adults um, we're going to record the result using a numeric fraction so the top number indicates the distance that the client is standing from the chart and then the denominator is going to be what a normal eye could have read at that particular line so bottom line is 2050 means that what I can read at a distance of 20 feet a regular person can read at 50 feet away okay 
and normal vision is 2020. And that's what that means. And I'm telling you right now, you're going to get a question that literally says the uh, visual acuity from the Snellen chart reads, I don't know, 2100, right? And you're going to need to know what that means. Right? That's usually how we have to do that as well. Or it will break it down and say, hey, um, regular people or, or the patient is able to read at 20 feet where regular people can read at 100 feet. And we'll know that that's 20, 2100, right? So those are the two scenarios that usually pop up when it's talking about this specific question because there's not a whole lot we're going to deal with regarding the Snellen chart, but you do need to know that it's here for visual acuity as well. All right, next slide. All right, a couple of things really quick. Wheezes are, again, musical noises or, or pseudo-musical noises heard during inspiration, expiration, or both. Um, it's because of a narrow passageway, which is why we get that whistling sound. Uh, ronkai is usually heard on expiration, and that's from an excessive production of mucus. It usually accumulates the air passage, but is clear with coughing. Crackles have that bubbling sound. That tells me that there's fluid in the alveoli. That tells me that I probably need to do some type of pharmacological management, um, such as a furosemide or a Lasix, right? Uh, plural friction rub is characterized by creaking, groaning, grating. It sounds like sandpaper scratching here. Here's what it sounds like, ready? I just grabbed a Walmart receipt and rubbed it together. So that's what it sounds like. A little bit sand, sandier though. Um, and those sounds are localized over an area of inflammation because that is what a, a plural friction rub is. This is an area of inflammation and it's the inflammatory mediators is causing all of this crazy pain that's associated with pleurisy. Okay, next slide. So when we talk about part of our examination for the lungs, we have to ask about cigarette smoking, okay? Bottom line. We have to calculate things in pack years. So calculation for pack years for someone who smokes a pack per day for four years. So one pack per day for four years is four pack years, right? So what we do is we multiply the number of packs smoked per day by the number of years that they've smoked total. And you're gonna need to know how to do that calculation. Next slide. So when we're dealing with patients who have really, really nasty disease processes and maybe they get a pretty bad um, answer on the progression of that disease process, a lot of times we will have patients who are in denial. Denial is not just a river in Egypt. Haha, <laughs> did you get the joke? Denial, it's a real stage of grief. It is detrimental to the patient because they will stop taking their medication. They will stop showing up to their appointments because their denial has taken over their understanding of their world around them. Okay? Um, minimizing their health problems. Um, acting like it's not that big of a deal. Act acting like it's not life-threatening, acting like the doctors are dumb. These are all ways that we produce denial, okay? It can lead to avoidance of self-care measures. Again, not making follow-up appointments, not taking your medications. This can actually speed up a disease process. So when we recognize that a patient is in denial, we have to do something about it as fast as we can. So please understand what denial means how denial is uh, presented with the patient, um, and what the coping strategy of denial does to the patient. All right, next slide. Now, when we are using an otoscope uh, to check ears, uh, the correct procedure is to, uh, for regular adults, pull the pinna up and back so that we can get into the external canal. If they're younger than three years, you would pull the pinna down and back. So here's how you do this. If they're under three years, then you pull down because three is a lower number. So pull down less than three. Anybody else above the age of three, pull up. Okay, done. That's how you figure that out. So uh, make sure that you tilt the head slightly away and hold it upside down as if it were a big pen, because that way it gets all of uh, the hardware out of your way so that you can actually see through the speculum. Um, 
sometimes you have to have a bigger speculum to make sure that it is for an adult ear and a tinier one for a pediatric setting. So make sure that you're using the right cover and speculum um, for that patient so that we're not crowding space, we're not, um, not having enough space to be able to visualize everything. Just make sure it fits the ear. Next slide. All right, so a couple of things we're gonna do. We're gonna talk about the voice or the whisper test. Again, this is reminiscent on the slides we just talked about earlier where we are gonna stand uh, one to two feet away from the client, um, ask them to block one of their ears. Uh, we're gonna quietly whisper a statement and then they just need to repeat that. And then each ear is tested separately. So please understand that as well. And that would be the voice test or the whisper test. Don't ever turn your back to them. Don't ever stand behind them. Okay, next slide. So I had an opportunity to give us some nice points for objective data versus subjective data. So again, objective data is obtained through the physical examination, vital sign measurement, something that the nurse observes, diagnostic studies, things of that nature. Subjective data is what the client says about them. So objective data, peripheral edema. Objective data, apical pulse is 78. Respiration's 18. Subjective, I've had constipation for the last three days. I have a pain score of six out of 10, okay? So give yourself some easy points. All right, next slide. All right, 0 0.125 milligrams. We're gonna convert this into micrograms. So there are 1,000 micrograms and one milligram. There are three zeros in the number 1,000. So we're gonna go three places over to the right because that's how you do it. So one, two and three and that means that is 125 micrograms is 0 0.125 milligrams it's really that easy okay i'm going to go ahead and go to the next slide if you have any other questions about this one let me know i'm happy to help out one more time micrograms there's a thousand micrograms and one milligram cool because it's micro which means it's smaller so we're going to move this decimal place one two three times over and 125 micrograms is going to be 0 0.125 milligrams. All right. Okay. So a client has used a third of their medication, which originally contained 30 pills. How many pills are remaining? Well, if it is a denominator of three, three goes into 30 10 times. Cool. So each third is going to equal to 10. So if I've used a third, that means 30 minus 10 equals 20, which is how many is remaining. That's how you do that, that type of math, okay? I think that that should be okay. If you need any extra help, just give me a, send me a text, give me a call, I'll, I'll walk you through it, okay? No big deal. Okay, final thoughts. Final thoughts are pay attention to the lecture, show up to the Zoom on Thursday, Make sure um, that you are heavily taking nice copious notes for this overview. Make sure that you are understanding all the concepts. If you don't, go back to the lecture about that topic that you're having problems with and go back to that slide and listen to it again. If you're still stuck, grab your book, see if you can figure out. If you're still stuck, send me a text message or give me a call, preferably between the hours of not 11.30 at night to not 3 in the morning. Beyond that, I'll let it slide, honestly. I just need a couple hours of sleep. You guys are going to do great. I love you and I'm proud of you all. It's really going to be okay, all right? This is going to be a different exam, and this exam is going to be killer because we're going to do so good, and um, then we're going to start enjoying each other and enjoying class. So that's all I've got, and I will see you pretty soon. Bye.